Thank you everyone for joining our session today on trade finance, digitization, and SWIFT for corporates. While this session has been pre-recorded, I will be joining live, so please feel free to ask any questions and I will do my best to answer them. My name is Mark Kagan and I represent domestic Japanese corporate banking clients and also corporate banking clients from a trade finance perspective here at MUFG Bank. Between my time here and previously with JP Morgan, I have been supporting corporate clients with their trade finance solutions for over 13 years. Enough about me though, I'd like to introduce to you our panelists for today. Henry Byrne joined Microsoft in 2016 as Senior Treasury Manager Trade Finance. He is responsible for managing the global trade finance business in order to mitigate credit risk. Mr. Byrne comes from a background in banking. Marcio Rigetti with Johnson Controls has been with the company since January of 07 and currently supports the Treasury leadership as Treasurer Americas and also recently led globally with bank relationships and the debt and capital markets activity for the company. In his current role, Mr. Rigetti also contributes supporting the business growth strategy in the Americas, as well as optimizing the Americas cash management processes. Prior to joining Johnson Controls, Marcio served as regional treasurer LATAM and Pen at Penalpina World Transport in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and treasurer at Wrexham South America in Sao Paulo. Prior to his current role, Mr. Rigetti also led Johnson Controls LATAM Regional Center as tre regional treasurer. I really want to thank you both so much for taking the time to participate in our GTR panel today. I believe this topic to be quite timely and of great importance to our audience joining us today. More than ever, digitization is top of mind for both banking and corporate professionals alike. Under the current pandemic conditions, we all have experienced challenges in dealing in sending and receiving of documents, obtaining original wet signatures amongst other various roadblocks. One way some corporates have been able to get ahead of these challenges has been through implementation and utilization of SWIFT for corporates. Companies that have adopted this structure have eliminated the need for manual processing and physical paper transfer and now benefit from quick electronic transfer via push button, push button transmission, making the entire end-to-end -end process more swift and seamless than ever possible before while also minimizing the risk of lost documents by operating through a much more secure manner. We are very lucky to have representatives of, the two, of two companies that have converted over to such streamlined processes with the engagement of GTC, known as Global Trade Corporation. It's a company that provides its clients with a third party front end plan for, platform used to execute, receive and report via the SWIFT authenticated messaging system in a consolidated manner across their trade finance bank group. Microsoft has partnered with GTC on the receiving side related to their incoming, ex incoming export and standby letters of credit issued in Microsoft's favor from their counterparts' issuing banks. On the other hand, JCI has implemented a structure where GTI GTC provides a front end platform used by the company to electronically and seamlessly issue outgoing instruments and interact with counterparty banks globally. I'd like to begin our panel discussion by hearing from Henry and Marcio on what the driving forces were for deciding to implement this process and structure. I'll be asking each question to both panelists so we may hear perspectives from both sides. Henry, I'll begin with you. Um, what were the primary motivating factors that you considered or uh, Microsoft considered in moving into a SWIFT for corporate structure for Microsoft's trade finance activities. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, Marcio, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak on today's panel. Uh, you're right, Mark. It's a very exciting time for us in Treasury, uh, and in particular in trade, in terms of what COVID brings and uh, how important digitization is now to the market. I suppose what. Uh, what were the driving forces for us was, um, you know, we operate very much on a regional basis. And in terms of having one centralized, uh, transparent approach, it was very much a, a disparate process. So we had each of our uh, main operating centers in each of our regions. 
uh, managing securities independently. So it was very difficult for us to uh, get a transparent and holistic view on exactly what trade exposures we had. And of course, the knock-on effect from that is being in Treasury, the reporting ability, um, and trying to collate all information from different bank portals, from different Excel spreadsheets, from uh, different SharePoint sites made it extremely challenging. Um, the other thing is, I suppose, when we look to onboard new banks in terms of our trade finance activity, we found it very, very difficult operating in that disparate uh, kind of a process. So, you know, it made perfect sense for us to look at uh, MT798 as a way in which we could digitize that process and standardize that with all of our banks. Great, thank you. And, and um, you know, coming from the banking perspective, it, it's, uh, you don't always see the other side on the client side when you have a very large bank group, you have very many uh, different tokens and logins and portals and trying to consolidate all that information, it can get very difficult. So that's, uh, that's definitely a huge benefit of using the process. Um, Mar Marcio, I'm sure you have very similar experience, but I, I know you guys have taken a different approach to how you've implemented and, and utilized uh, GTC for SWIFT for corporates. Uh, could we also hear from you on, on driving factors from JCI's perspective? Sure. Hey, Marks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm really excited to be here. Hi, Henry. Um, so pretty much the same, I guess, driving factor, right? I mean, being a global organization organized by regions as well, you can think of, you know, a huge portfolio across the board, right? And, you know, the need to, uh, to have a centralized depository of information that is easily auditable uh, with, you know, strong uh, reporting capabilities to serve different, uh, you know, internal customers and inter external customers as well, such as, you know, auditors um, and even in the IRS and, uh, to such extents, right? But um, um, doing all of that in an automated fashion, right? And enabling a smart and efficient way to communicate and interact with the banks on the issuance side uh, was, I guess, you know, all of that combined was, uh, you know, the driving force for us to look for such a, for such application, right? So you were right on our case, we, we issue, uh, uh, you know, a lot in all of the regions where we, uh, we do business and, you know, you know, having all of this done on a manual basis was pretty much getting out of hand. So practically speaking, uh, we were looking into automating all that and enabling, you know, ex you know, extreme and adventure, adventures, uh, you know, uh, auditable uh, process, right? When, when we're issuing, as you would imagine, you're involving since the people in the front end facing the customer to the, uh, uh, you know, senior management in that approval process. And the tool itself pretty much enables, you know, a very uh, automated and auditable approval process all the way through. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, the reasoning and the rationale behind the, uh, the idea of uh, searching for such application. Thank you. And, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I do have a little bit more insight into JCI's process and scoring because, uh, you know, you know we, we did some work together in, in a previous life. So I, I know some of the answers to these questions that you may have, but I'll ask the next question to you here on what were some of your scoring variables considered when deciding on a path forward for a front end system and or engaging a third party provider? Because obviously, um, you know, in Swift for corporates, you do have the optionality of, as a, as a corporate, creating your, your own front end platform, but also engaging a third party provider and, and making sure that that third party provider um, is, the, is the right partner to work with on, on that kind of process. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah, that's for me, Mark. Yeah. I suppose the key for us was the, uh, and the key sort of factor we had to consider was the interoperability between GTC's portal and our own ERP system uh, and tying that in then with MT798 with our IT guys. Um, I mean, that was the key factor uh, and that was one we had to spend a lot of time on um, ensuring that uh, it was as streamlined as possible. I suppose the other key um, sort of scoring variable for us was did it make sense economically? Um, you know, was the real time savings. And I think we, we, we spent a lot of time on a project where we literally took each transaction 
that we handled from start to finish and measured in terms of the timing that each of our units spent on that particular transaction. And it was an interesting exercise because at the end of the year, we were able to see how much time we were actually spending physically on these transactions, which is not something that corporates do that often. And, and based on that, against having a SWIFT 798 digitized process merged with an online platform, it just, it just meant it was chalk and cheese, to be honest. Um, the savings were incredible. The economic benefits were incredible for us. Um, and, you know, as a result, um, it, it created additional sort of resources that we were tying up in the day-to-day -day flow that we were able to direct elsewhere. So, you know, from that point of view, interoperability, I think, was very important. Probably key to us also was the economic uh, savings that we had out of it in terms of headcount and in physical uh, dollars. That's very interesting because, uh, again, from a banking perspective, we, we do that kind of analysis to understand how much cost goes into each widget that we produce. Um, I, I, I'd say it's very rare, but I've never heard of, of a corporate doing that on, on their side as well. So that's very interesting. And you were able to kind of quantify that information and makes a lot of sense. Um, Mar Marcy, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you there in, in terms of um, how you guys went through the decision making process on um, whether it was a front end system kind of integration within the company internally or engaging with a third party provider and how you went about choosing that third party provider. Yeah, so if, if you think about it, right, in almost in line with what I um, also just said, being in a global organization, right, you're inter interfacing and interacting with multiple different banks, uh, you know, around the world. So standardization is, is, is really important because that triggers, you know, savings, right? Cost savings, like uh, Henry just alluded to, right? Instead of having to develop multiple different uh, ways to interface and communicate with different, you know, banks, uh, you know, in different regions and different countries, you know, SWIFT allows like standardization across the board which is a, uh, you know, a cost saving enabler pretty much, right? Uh, the network dependability as well, right? There's a reason why the banking industry is using uh, SwiftNet, right? So it's dependable, right? I mean, there, it, you know, I don't, I don't know of a day that's, uh, that uh, the network went, went down. And we're talking about serving, you know, as I said before, the, uh, the people facing the customers, right? So they don't have time for excuses like, sorry, my network is down. They need a quick response, they need a dependable system, right? And then finally, security, right? I mean, I think SwiftNet delivers a very safe environment, right? For, you know, the information and the traffic of information, right? Between the corporate itself and the banks. So, so, so I, would, I would tackle that standardization, you know, cost efficiency and security. Great, thank you. And and specifically, Marcio, in terms of um, my understanding is that from for Swift for corporates to be utilized, there needs to be a front end system that people at your company can utilize in order to interact with the Swift messaging system. Was that ever a consideration for JCI to uh, utilize resources and investment to create it on your own, or was it always you know the decision that we're going to go ahead and engage with a third party provider for that? No, we, we, we never uh, contemplated uh, developing this, you know, particular uh, application internally. Uh, to be quite frank with you, um, um, you know, user friendliness was, was a key factor here. The, the, the application, at, you know, of our choice is very friendly. Um, as I said, we deployed it in a way that, you know, the front end user, like the person fronting the, the customer, like with boots on the ground is also a user of the system. And so it had to be something like, uh, you know, made for that specific, uh, you know, uh, purpose, right? So very easy, use, easy to use, very friendly and easy to implement as well. I mean, the, 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 the application is, is, is very simple and, you know, quick to be implemented. The, the approval process flow, as I mentioned before, is very transparent, very uh, easy to use. So your, your, your time spent on training 
a lot of those different parties is is uh, is also optimized because it's made in a way that it's it's uh, you know it's it's uh, it's easy to use. So, I mean, um, you know, that's actually one of the, we we thought we would not be able to do it any better, right? Than these guys did. So, of course, that played a you know a significant role here. Mark, if I could just add uh, something there, I mean, just directly yeah. to answer the question there. We're actually going through a process at the, mo at the moment where we're looking at digitizing our issuance side of the business. So at the moment, we use 798 and GTC on the receivable side. We're also looking at something on the issuance side. Obviously, that uh, it makes sense and synergies and so on. Uh, and given that we're a consolidated trade finance business, it makes perfect sense to have it all in one. Naturally, we've looked at third party providers like GTC and others in terms of their front end portals. Um, and we're also very interested in MT798. But what, we're, what we are looking at, which is interesting, and it shows uh, you know, what techs are looking at nowadays, we're looking at developing our own power app, which will uh, give us that interoperability with um, uh, Swift. And you know, so we're hoping then that uh, early next year, we'd be in a position to replace our existing uh, portal uh, with uh, our own power app that will have swift connectivity. So it's a straight straight to uh, processing, front-to-end uh, issuance. And uh, we're, we're excited about that. And I think that's something that uh, I think the corporate market would be excited about. It's very interesting. I mean, as a technology company, I think that's probably a good fit and makes a lot of sense. You know, you probably have the appropriate resources and, um, you know, if, if, if it's, if it's something that you're able to do, it sounds like, um, it's the right, it's the right move. So obviously that's something each company faces when making the decision of how to interact with the SWIFT messaging system and with their banking par partners. So thank you for that right. additional information. That's very interesting. Um, Henry, I'll, I'll come back to, I'll go to you on this next question. Um, I, I do, like I said earlier, I do have experience on the challenges side of implementation. Um, you are working with, you know, your, your bank group, which can be uh, quite a large um, number of banks in this type of situation. And, you know, at least from my perspective, understanding how this works, there's a lot of standardization that lends itself to making the process a little bit easier in terms of one document across all your banking partners, but then you also have to go into testing and um, maybe you know with each of those banks for for SWIFT capability. So, can you tell us at least some of the challenges you you experienced during implementation, and, and maybe a little bit how you were able, able to overcome those, and a little bit more into what I mentioned in terms of what those uh, those variables were in terms of documentation, testing, etc. Sure, sure. But let me just preface that, Mark, by saying. I suppose their initial observation when we looked at uh, a front end system from GTC, as well as digitizing our process back in 2016 was to consult with our partner banks. I think similar to Marcio, you know, we deal with group partner banks globally. We have key relationships with them right across the whole treasury spectrum. So that was important just to see in terms of their capabilities, where they were on that curve, if you like. And what was interesting to us was that there was a very, very low take up amongst the banks back in 2016. Certainly more had appetite on the issuance side than they did on the receivable side. So that, that, that was the first sort of key observation for us. And the key sort of hurdle was to try and support our banks in terms of where we wanted to go. And that was SWIFT and a, a front end system. So. Over time, a lot of our banks now have become 798 capable, and uh, it's great to see that uh, the corporate market now is adopting it. In terms of the sort of challenges, um, I, I suppose, look, one of the key challenges we had was the, the, the level of work which our IT people had to uh, undertake in terms of making sure we had that uh, interoperability, I keep saying, with our ERP system. I mean, that... that uh, that took a lot of time and a lot, a lot of resources to ensure that, uh, you know, we had that interoperability and it was a streamlined process. Um, you mentioned it yourself in terms of documentation. I mean, you know, I'll even narrow it down further to say that uh, in order to engage in uh, MT798 and, and uh, SWIFT for corporates, both bank to corporate and corporate to bank, typically banks will look for what they call a score agreement, which just allows and permits that communication of message 
vice versa. And what we were finding was a lot of the banks, again, were new to this. So there was no standardized score agreement that was available. And in fact, right up to this day, we're finding with different banks, there's different uh, variations of score agreements. And most of them, in fact, are asking us for their uh, uh, considerations and their interpretations of agreements. So, you know, again, that's where supporting your partner bank was into play and one that we've had to, uh, had to adopt. I mean, the testing itself, I think as Marcio alluded to, it relatively straightforward, but, you know, we went through a process where we started onboarding one bank at a time rather than a full suite of banks. So we were finding we were starting off on testing and that would take six weeks. And maybe we fell into the trap naively, if you like, where we were testing each individual message that we were involved in. So an MT700. LC. We then looked at amendments uh, 707. We then looked at 799. So we went right through the suite of messages that we would see in a day-to-day basis. And what we were finding is it was taking far too long. It was taking six weeks, seven weeks to conduct and complete with each bank. That's on top of the score agreement uh, and our own internal work in terms of IT. Over time, and during that initial year, 2016, we were able to streamline that process so much so that we got that down to a week. So a couple of key messages were highlighted and identified as to these are the main messages that we receive. Once we have that connectivity with the bank, uh, it should be relatively straightforward then to send a message, regardless of what message type it was. So there are the three key sort of considerations we had, Mark, was the, um, uh, the bank appetite, if you like, the bank capabilities to support us the uh, amount of time and uh, resources put in by our IT people to ensure we had that interoperability uh, and the testing. Uh, And again, over time, we managed to uh, streamline that down uh, quite a bit. Thanks, Henry. And that's interesting on the testing. So instead of testing each and every potential possible message type, you narrowed it down to more so the message types that you would expect to see on a regular basis, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that was one of the key things we did uh, later on in the uh, process, Mark, was we highlighted, look, are we going to be receiving third party LCs? Yes, we will from time to time. What about reimbursement instructions? We don't need too many of them. What about uh, claims, uh, 710s, message types? Do we need many of them? No, we don't do that because we don't have FILAC. Many of our banks don't have FILAC. So we tend to do that outside of at GTC and MT798. So we narrowed it down specifically to those day-to-day messages we received. 700s, 767s, 799s, and then the amendments on the back of each of those. Appreciate it, thank you. So Marcio, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you know, just kind of going on, on onto what Henry said, you know, documentation is can always be difficult and, you know, banks kind of each have their own perspective. So, um, I, I assume that's that's a challenge that you experienced as well, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more from JCI's perspective. No, indeed. But uh, in my case, uh, at least for the implementation of this application, I was very fortunate because JCI had score agreements signed with pretty much all the banks from our bank group already. Remember, we we run our uh, you know payment factor on SwiftNet already, so that wasn't you know that wasn't too complicated to be uh, to be quite frank with you. For this specific, uh, you know, scope itself, we had most of the job done already. Um, and then it, it comes down to testing, right? To, uh, you know, banks basically delivering what, you know, were our expectations in respect to the types of messages that as they have to be exchanged during the lifetime of a, of a, of a guarantee. Um, and, and same as Henry just, uh, just uh, pointed out, right? We also started this, uh, maybe two to three years ago when not all of the banks were fully prepared to, ex- to exchange all types of envelopes, right, that are necessary to give maintenance to, uh, to a guarantee during its lifetime, such as, you know, any kind of amendments, you know, in the amount, adjustment in the amount, you know, maturity dates, or, or even the, um, um, you know, even the, uh, the termination of a guarantee, right, when the guarantee is pulled back, basically, right, so, so there, there were a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth, you know, on the testing side. Some of the banks were ready with the full scope of, uh, of envelopes. Some of them weren't. 
um, and also in a lot of piloting, right, as usual, I guess. But, but you know, in the end, I mean, I think um, just as Henry said, I mean, as we evolved and we we walk through this uh, through this uh, you know learning curve in this implementation process, we narrowed it down to to uh, to uh, say a two weeks implementation timeline with uh, with with, with uh, each bank. And remember, we had to take like we actually give it uh, like a you know, regional approach with regional uh, master reimbursement agreements. We can talk about that later. And also global master reimbursement agreements, right? So some of these, um, you know, interfaces would have to consider some um, local specs and some of them were just, you know, bilateral. So those were much simpler, right, to implement and quicker to implement. So for the, so for the regional uh, implementation kind of scope, yes, um, it would take maybe almost a month to get everything, uh, you know, lined up and tested and, uh, you know, and, and verified for a global, uh, for a global scope there, then would, it would be a little more uh, of a challenge. And I would say maybe almost two months to get everything done from, you know, point A to point Z, right? I'm talking about documentation, you know, MRA uh, contract, all, you know, the, 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 the full scope of, of envelopes, right? And different MT94, uh, different uh, MT messages. So it, it really depends on the scope, on the, you know, if it's a regional, a global, or just a country bilateral. Uh, and also, I guess, as Andrew said, probably uh, today, most of the banks will be you know, ready and capable to exchange everything, every single type of message required to you know, maintain a guarantee during its lifetime. So. Yeah, banks have kind of had to um, get up to speed very quickly on this because the interest has been pushing from the corporate side, right? So um, it's been on them to have the ability to do that. Um, I, I, I wanted... just one point, Mark, Mark. I just yeah. want to mention, uh, um, and it's interesting to you from the banking uh, side of things perspective, but I, I suppose one of the other key things, the support of your bank is important. Um, and Mark, you mentioned it there about exchanging RMAs at the start of the process. Believe it or not, depending on the size of the banks and having the support of the, like their IT people is crucial because that in itself could delay the whole process. And we were finding initially we were spending three, four, five, six weeks in terms of exchanging RMAs, just making sure there was a test message before we actually got into the testing, the UAT testing of the system itself. So I think that was just important, just to make sure that the, you know, your banks are on side, the relevant people within the banks are aware of what's happening, and you have that uh, ongoing support. Yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's a factor of, sorry, uh, Marcia, I, I think that's a factor of experience of the bank, right? Uh, how, how often they've gone through this process and how familiar they are with having to interact with a corporate on getting these kinds of things done, right? And do they know who to go to and who to, who the resources are? So uh, I think it's, like I said, about experience. But Marcio, sorry to cut you off. Please go ahead. No, just to compliment, it's, it's, it's absolutely right what Henry just said. And we took the approach of um, you know, doing the uh, the MRA exchange in parallel to the uh, to the IT development, right? So, and that can be risky at times, right? I mean, for the reasons that uh, Henry just alluded to, right? So, sometimes you're ready on the IT side, and you're still not anywhere on the uh, you know commercial side aspect of the of the whole structure, right? And if you don't have uh, an MRA in place, I mean, it's you know all the IT development is almost uh, you know useless, right? So. The banks must be aligned and must be willing to support and you know, you know, and partner up with this from uh, from point A to 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 B, right? And and from the corporate side, you're trying to corral this on a multiple level, right? You're you're having to keep track of this across all your banking partners. Um, so that's that's there's difficulty there in itself. Uh, uh, and, and and you know, most of the certainly, I'm sure Marcio and ourselves have the same issue, Mark, where we're dealing globally. So we either have one central uh, focal point in terms of the banks where we want all our messages sent to, or we do it on a regional basis. And we've adopted the regional basis approach. So in other words, all our trade activity in APAC is directed towards our partner banks in APAC. So you can imagine, likewise, we do for EMEA and we do for Americas. So you can imagine for each of our partner banks, we've had to go through almost three RMA setups for each of the regions. So uh, again, just to make people aware that that's, uh, that's another 
hurdle or challenge needs to be overcome. Uh, hurdle was the word that I, I had in my head <laughs> hearing you say that exactly. Um, I do want to be conscious of, of Henry and Marcio's time and, and GTR's time as well. So uh, I'm going to kind of move through a little bit uh, the, next, the, ne the next couple of questions. We talked about uh, project timeline a little bit. If maybe each of you could touch on very quickly from start of considering um, moving into this process to actually transacting what, what you see as an estimated timeline for that. And then uh, if you could touch on a little bit in terms of all the various resources, resource groups internally that you had to have engage. I mean, we touched on IT, uh, we touched on documentation. So maybe it's, it's either contracts or legal or maybe yourselves and, um, and, and a little bit on the engagement of each of those parties, if you can. Um, Henry, I'll, I'll start with you, please. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, look, back, back in 2016, when we undertook this project, uh, I mean, we set aside 12 months before it went live. And in effect, it was actually 15 months. So uh, I'm sure if we were to do it now, Mark, you know, we think a lot differently and a lot cleverly. So uh, yeah, I'm sure it's something that we could bring down to around nine months. And as I said, on the issuance uh, side that we're looking at, we're hopeful, as I said, to have our own power app developed in six months with swift uh, connectivity for the three months after that. So th that's what happened for us back in 2016. Um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, initial scope, initial testing, um, looking at the alternatives. I mean, GTC was one, MT798 was another that we looked at. Uh, Bolero was another uh, option that was out there. And it worked indeed for one or two of our subsidiaries that we had acquired that already had Bolero as a sort of digitized uh, environment. Uh, but for us, uh, you know, MT798, I think made sense on a global basis. Um, in terms of stakeholders, um, and again, it's interesting when you sit down and go through these projects, you realize how many are involved, you realize the challenges that you have. And again, being a global organization, we're dealing with individuals in different time zones and in different regions. So we've got to be conscious of that as well. But we were involving people, obviously, from our trade finance uh, team, uh, our IT team. Um, the purpose of us undertaking that project in terms of digitizing the receipt of receivables was to support our credit services teams globally. You know, at the end of the day, we receive an awful lot of our securities uh, as a means of mitigating the credit risk uh, in turn for credit limits that we're providing for, for corporate. So they were integral to, uh, to the whole process. Uh, they were integral in terms of the testing, uh, not necessarily the MT798, but of GTC and whether it was functional uh, and also adaptable and interoperable with their own SAP system that they had. So that, that was key. Um, uh, legal and compliance, I think, were two uh, uh, teams that we quite often forget, but uh, took an active role in our process, ensuring what we were doing was right. Um, I know Marcio mentioned at the very start, uh, and is absolutely right in terms of security, security risks and issues. Where is our transactions held? Where is the main server? How are they uh, held? You know, what's the business continuity plan if something happened either with the system or with SWIFT or with GTC? Um, so legal and compliance took an active uh, role in that. Uh, our IT, uh, as I mentioned, our treasury team uh, took a role in it to see if we could leverage off uh, the system in terms of their day-to-day -day SWIFT activities in terms of payments and, and so on. So it really was a full team approach of about six or seven stakeholders that took us 12 to 15 months uh, from start to finish before we were able to uh, go live, Mark. I, 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 can, I can see how security would be such a big consideration. I mean, you are uh, in the simplest way outside of using Swift for corporates, you're interacting maybe with manual paperwork or PDFs, but you're really only interacting directly from corporate to bank or bank to corporate. Now you're introducing additional variables such as, you know, you're interacting with a third party provider, they're interacting with Swift and then Swift is interacting with the bank. And, you know, Swift is an authenticated messaging system bank to bank, but also now corporate to bank. Um, but it's something that as a corporate, you really have to consider if those are the risks you're willing to accept and, and how secure those uh, different uh, types of routing really is for you. Right, right. Yep. Thank you for that. 
Uh, uh, Marcio, I'll, I'll pose the same to you because I think it'd be interesting to hear. I'm assuming it's similar stakeholders, but uh, in terms of timeline, I think it's interesting for our audience to understand if there's corporates that are considering this, what they really need to be thinking about if, if moving into this kind of structure. Very consistent to Henry's experience. I mean, if you're taking it from the uh, you know, RFP uh, point, right, to the uh, you know, issuance, but to being able to start issuing right through, uh, through the application, I would tell, tell folks, you know, provision at least 12 months uh, to 14 months. Um, you know, it, it will also depend on the, you know, the, the, uh, the way the corporate will module the deployment, right? If it's going to be, you know, multiple bilateral country level, uh, you know, interfaces or regional interfaces or global interfaces or all of them, all of the above, right? Um, that will, that will, uh, that will be uh, probably a determining factor of, you know, you know, timeline as well. Um, pricing, of course, is behind that. So, um, you know, and, 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 and play a significant, um, you know, aspect there because you're going to have to negotiate with all of those different banks and that will determine the best approach if it's bilateral, uh, country level bilateral, if it's a regional uh, connectivity or an agreement or global, right? So um, I would say interacting with banks on all that commercial uh, side of things on the issuance side again, right? So it's, it's something you have to provision yourself at least an entire quarter, um, you know, of intense dialogue and, and negotiation, right? Um, you know, the, the, the other aspect, right, and, and Henry mentioned that, right, on the issuance side, and that's probably common to every corporate in the world, we're also issuing the parental guarantees through the, through the platform, right? So you do have to engage with your legal department, uh, you know, and, and, you know, work on those uh, because it wants to standardize that, those templates as well, right? So what is it that will work? In, in Europe and would not work in APEC, you know, do you have to, you know, put together different standards that would accommodate different uh, particularities or regulatory requirements? Or can we take like a, you know, a global uh, approach and, you know, standardize everything? So that's that's a length discussion involves, involves legal from a corporate level to a uh, country level. And then once you, you, you get to a common uh, sense there and agreement, you start drafting all that, right? And then you circulate that for different, you know, amongst the different parts and then you, you know, get into, uh, I guess, a common, uh, you know, template. You, you start uploading that, all, all that in the system. And then finally, um, I would say, and that's, it's, it's kind of a complex, right? But, you know, when you think about the approval process flow, right, which is basically a SOX, a SOX kind of, a, uh, you know, process, you have to work on that, right? And design exactly who are going to be the parties involved here. You know, at which level and thresholds you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you know, kicking. You know, the term. You know, uh, certain approval level and so forth. You have to involve the business there, right? I mean, who's going to be the 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 the, the initiator of those uh, requests? Who's going to be the next level of approval and so forth? So, that on its own is is another important uh, you know um, aspect of this implementation that depending on the complexity of of the organization that can take at least 10 months in our case you know being a very complex organization you know spread across the globe it was it was something uh, it was a project on its own right and so one should also provision at least uh, 10 10 um, in it, uh, 10 months to get that done and that can be done in parallel as well um, and then just, you know, uh, program accordingly uh, when you're pretty much done with it. But you have to start that, you know, very early because, because it can be very complex, right? People have different views of everything, as you would imagine. Um, then once, once you're ready to issue, you have to train the people, right? I mentioned many times in the way we're, we're, we, we deploy the, the, the application in, in JCI, we're basically... Um, you know, allowing people uh, on, on a, you know, operational level to collaborate in the uh, application. And that requires a lot of training, you know, and depending on how complex organization is, you have to train different, 
you know, silos of your organization accordingly, you know, and make sure that everybody's sharp and ready to go. And, and that, again, will depend on how big and, and how complex the, uh, the, 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 the organization is, but you should also allocate at least uh, six months to get that all done, if not more, and can also be done in parallel with everything. So, so as, as you heard me, I guess, um, you, you easily realize, right, you have several different, uh, um, I guess, work streams going on in parallel. And you have to be able to coordinate all of that if you want to accomplish, you know, the full deployment, um, you know, and go live in say twelve months time frame. But that all has to be taken into account. I, I mean, you explained very clearly how, 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 you know, much of a consideration it really is. And uh, you know, I don't want to use the word behemoth lightly, but you know, with all the various work streams. Um, if you want to keep to a shorter timeline, you really have to keep everything parallel and be able to manage each of those as kind of their own projects, but also within one large project. So um, you touched on a little bit about uh, training some of uh, the employees at your company to be able to interact and do what they need to do um, with the uh, Swift for Corporate system or GTC, et cetera. Um, has that process, I, I guess, what benefits have you been able to realize through that? Um, it sounds like maybe you've been able to consolidate the teams that are involved in these types of instruments and, and, um, and processes, and, and maybe you could touch a little bit more broader on, on a little bit about benefits that you've seen here. Yeah, okay. I mean, training is, is uh, extremely important, Mark. Um, uh, Mark, was right. He's alluded to it. Uh, and particularly when you're a global organization, people in different regions, people in different time zones, trying to coordinate a training plan uh, is challenging. Um, but it, nevertheless, it's vital. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time coming up with different training workshops. Um, and I have to say GTC were helpful in that respect uh, in providing regional, both virtual and physical training workshops. Um, but, you know, in terms of the benefits, what has the benefits been? I mean, I think, look, it, it goes without saying, um, you know, it's a standard. We now have a standardized process in terms of receiving securities. Paper is gone. We no longer are dealing in paper. And I'm conscious of, you know, the trade environment. And many corporates will have heard before that this business has been paper driven for the last hundred odd years. And many thought it will continue in that way. You've still got your traditional uh, documentation in letters of credit like bills of lading and certs of origin. But I think what COVID has done now, uh, it's actually accelerated, I think, that process, that changeover process. I think people now are seeing with, with staff working remotely the difficulties in if dealing in paperwork and how it's done, if dealing in different systems, how do we centralize and, and, and give a holistic view of that. So I think it's become more and more prevalent. I think it'll happen uh, an awful lot quicker than people think. In my view, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a huge uh, sort of swift change towards digitization. Uh, and I mean, the benefits are there. I mean, you know, a standard, uh, a standardized process, one straight through automated standardized process, uh, remove paper flow. I mean, that again, for a global organization like us was a difficulty. Uh, and I mean, again, people don't think, but I mean, where do you store securely original documentation if you're dealing on a regional basis? So all that needs to be considered. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the cost, I think the economic savings, I think are, are there to be seen. Um, and definitely we've noticed uh, a huge economic saving uh, and probably one of the key uh, benefits of uh, MT798 is 7 uh, and GTC, as well as the uh, standardization now of uh, security processing. Yeah, I think you really hit on the relevancy of this topic today that we're talking about. And, you know, JCI and, and Microsoft have been able to be ahead of this curve. And that's why I think it's it's so such an important point to be discussing right now. And like you said, um, you know, this is something that, you know, we may see be much more utilized going forward in the future. Um, uh, Marcio, I'll pass it over to you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure very similar benefits. Um, maybe you could touch on some of the points that you've seen at JCI specifically. 
it's actually kind of hard to add uh, anything to Hen what Henry just said without being repetitive, right? Sure. I mean, it's pretty much the same. Um, so cost efficiency, standardization, fast response, right? I mean, it, it, it enables so much, right, in terms of different aspects of efficiency. Um, again, it's, it's pretty much in line with what uh, you just heard from Henry, right? I mean, there's literally nothing to be added there. Just one other thing to add, Mark, was the bank onboarding now is an awful lot easier and streamlined. You know, previously before having a, a digitized environment, a lot of paperwork going back and forth, trying to onboard banks, you know, as you mentioned yourself, tokens in terms of bank portals, that's now been eliminated now. And uh, uh, that we found an awful lot easier in terms of the bank onboarding process. Well, I think that kind of leads into my last question here um, in terms of um, what plans you have to expand your existing programs. And I guess that's kind of a broad question because, you know, from my perspective, expand could mean adding additional banks to your bank group that's going to be able to be uh, processing de dependent on regional capabilities or what they're what they can actually do specifically from an instrument perspective. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit more. And I know you touched a little bit on some of your plans for uh, future of digitization for Microsoft, but um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah, I, I know we're coming up to the time limit, so I'll keep it, I'll keep it brief. Two things we're looking at, uh, Mark. Obviously, we have a digitized receivable process. We want to have a digitized issuance process. Um, and I think that, uh, that that's clear. That's what we want to do. How do we do it? We either look at third party providers integrated with SWIFT or we look at our own. And they're the two sort of sides of the uh, project that we're looking at at the moment. Um, the other thing that we're also, uh, and we'd also maybe like to see developed, whether we can do it or not is a different thing, is, you know, we'd like to kind of create a bank marketplace where banks could quote for confirmation pricing on transactions. Um, you know, so I, I know some corporates have their own individual kind of portals where uh, banks register with that allows them then to uh, more or less enter a Dutch auction on transactions. I'd like to see that become a bit more um, visible um, and whether that's on the corporate front or whether the banks develop that. But to get to something where in addition to MT798 uh, is that we have a sort of a, a an automated and a digitized marketplace where banks could quote for specific transactions. That's interesting. I know that's been a, a topic for quite some time from the bank's perspective. It's just really how, how do you get it done and how do you get all the banks involved and to agree to get involved together and whether that's and how is the interface work for that? You know, like you said, is it from a bank's perspective? Is it from the corporate perspective? Is it done through Swift or is it a blockchain um, kind of solution, right? Um, if it would work from that perspective and, you know, the idea from blockchain that could be down the road, who knows? Um, but that, that is definitely an interesting, uh, concept. Um, Marcio, you know, I'll, I'll ask the same question to you again in terms of expansion, but I guess this could also be a question about consolidation. You know, um, when you first put this program together, you had your whole bank group based on their capability. And now that you've had some time, is there a consideration to consolidate into, uh, dealing with less banks or expanding with more banks or, you know, also, do you have plans to expand the program into other avenues that you're not using it for today? So um, when we when we plan for this, right, we try and, you know, try and, you know, put together like a, a strategy that would work from a liquidity coverage viewpoint and 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 pricing. Right. Um, so from a liquidity viewpoint, I think uh, that at this at this very moment, there would be no need for expansion. I think we, we plan well for that. Um, but here's here's what we learned with time, right? There's there's banks that are specialized in certain types of instruments, right? And or you know, more cost efficient in certain types of instruments. And then you 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 have to start, you know, thinking of you know adding those specialists. Um, if I may, into your, your portfolio, right? So for example, a financial guarantee in comparison to a performance guarantee, right? Not all banks can be as efficient from a cost perspective in, in those two areas. And you now you learn with time that maybe you need, you know, a specialist 
on a specific area of, uh, of trade finance in our, in our portfolio to cover for certain aspects of your business, right? So that's what we're uh, envisioning right now. At least here in my region, I'm trying to see if I can be as efficient as possible from a cost perspective, not ignoring you know, aspects like you know, you know, um, response timing as well, right? Because being an expert, it should mean you're faster you know, in, in responding to the, to the uh, business requirement as well. So that's the kind of uh, approach I'm taking right now after, you know, a couple of years running, you know, a couple of uh, regional and uh, one global MRA, right? So um, not all the banks are experts in everything. So you want to be able to serve your, you know, internal customers with the fastest in, in response and, you know, the most cost efficient one as well. So um, if, if I, if I, um, if I would, uh, you know, uh, talk about the next step here, I would say, you know, try and make sure that I cover for all of those, uh, you know, you know, aspects in my region specifically. Well, thank you very much. And um, Henry and Marcio, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for taking the time out and participating. I, I know I found the information very useful. I think our audience is going to find it extremely beneficial. Um, if they're considering it today, or maybe they're in the process of going through implementation today, or, you know, haven't even considered it before and, and, and maybe kind of uh, pushed into thinking about this. Um, I, I want to thank GTR for having us and, and really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much.